Welcome to Connections, Church Together at Home. Here's a psalm, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Here's a few verses from Colossians 1 using the message translation. He, Jesus, was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death his blood that poured down from the cross. So, vision. Now, there's a word. What does it make you think about when you hear it? Sight? Nothing much? Opportunity? Future? I mean, it's hard to have any when we're literally stuck in a pandemic. Spec savers? I'm over it. I can't be bothered. Some people I know have spent lots of personal time reflecting on their own personal vision for their life, what they want or believe God is prompting them to see happen in their lives over the next few years. One person I know set a vision to overcome emotional pain in her life by getting fitter. Her vision was to break barriers in her life by becoming a runner. Last week she reached a goal to run 100 kilometres in May and raised over a thousand pounds for Tear Fund. Another dear friend sensed that God's vision for her life was to be a leader of women, mentoring and encouraging women to be leaders in their own environment and in their life circumstances. She's now written a book, launched a leadership network, is a qualified spiritual director and coach as well as an ordained minister. Now, to you and me, these may feel big, exceptional visions and unrealistic for our lives, especially at the moment, locked down by coronavirus. In fact, sometimes, if we're honest, seeing a visionary person and hearing their stories can inspire us, but it can leave us feeling a bit worthless, with little to offer ourselves and no incentive to look beyond our own now situation. Right now, many people are spending time on quite a wide variety of visionary lockdown projects. It's how we're navigating time at home, isn't it? I've heard some great stories about people creating a more colourful garden, getting fencing painted and repaired, sorting a backlog of collectible stamps, getting them into albums, doing a long overdue craft for a grandchild, reading more writing letters to family with whom contact has been lost. Other people have been volunteering in new ways. Some have been given a vision for how their children can grow through lockdown and have rolled their sleeves up to be homeschool parents. We all have the capacity for vision, for making something beyond where we are. Perhaps one of the most well-known visions for the future was cast publicly in 1963 by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A vision for the United States in which the vision for human equality captured in the Emancipation Proclamation made by Abraham Lincoln a hundred years earlier would be actively embedded into the attitudes, laws and systems of the nation. You know, may well know some of the well-rehearsed words of his vision. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up 
and live out the true meaning of its creed. We will hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Over the last few weeks, we've seen all too well and with horror how this vision is far from being fully realised in so many different parts of the world. Racism, injustice and prejudice is still powerfully at large in our society and people are suffering in unimaginable ways because of this wrong. Yet at the same time, the vision of a world without prejudice and racism continues to motivate and spur us on to a transformed future. Some of what we're seeing reflects the fact that there is a very real tension in vision. It holds together realities of the past and the present, whilst also holding out the hand to grasp the future. Vision is all about the then, the now and the not yet. Where we were, where we are and where we want to be. Whether this means that we spend time to tearing down signs and symbols of a past we now see differently in, in light of today's wisdom or our convictions of today in order to repent and commit to a changed future is quite a big question. Um, and I hesitate at this. Whilst facing our sinfulness, past and present, is always part of repentance and that, and that enables a new future. Being focused on humanly dismantling what was may in fact actually hold us into that past. It is right, of course, that proper reparation is made for wrongful acts in the past. This is an important aspect of forgiveness and justice, facing the consequences of our action through the justice system, being held to account, saying sorry to others for things that we have done wrong. All very important, yet at the same time, doggedly f focusing on the past can lock us down into its story rather than into the hope of new life and future hope. Endlessly looking back can be a distraction and literally quite destructive. How many stories have you seen and read or even experienced personally of the way that shame about the past has held someone down and plagued their present and their future. Sometimes too, focusing on the past may even be a subtle way in which we're lured into an avoidance of allowing ourselves to be turned around and to engage into a vision of a new future. Oswald Chambers seems to capture this in his classic Christian writing, My Utmost for His Highest. He says, Beware of paying attention or going back to what you once were when God wants you to be something that you have never been. I wonder what your vision of the future includes. Who is God calling you to be? What is church being called to be in the days ahead? Some of the keys to unlocking this question um, are held in God's vision of us and God's vision for us. From the beginning, he created with real vision. If you read Genesis 1, you'll find it really difficult to ignore the sense of delight and goodness and Holy Spirit life and joy in the creation story. It's full of glimpses of the image of God himself. It reveals his vision for all creation, made in his image, the kingdom of God on earth. This is his vision for us, the kingdom of God on earth. The restoration or recreation of this kingdom within us and throughout the whole of creation is God's vision for us as individuals, as peoples, as nations, for the climate and for all that's created. Isn't this why Jesus taught his followers to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Paul captures this vision of how God's vision for restoration, recreation happens. He says it like this, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Through a relationship with Jesus, we are recreated, we're made new, we're turned around and set free 
to live beyond the barriers of all that locks us down in our lives, we join in with God's vision. Nicodemus discovered this. He discovered that by being recreated through Jesus, he also is filled with God's spirit. It's a work of God's spirit. We're made new, set free from the power of our past, the power of our present and the power of our future to hold us away from any relationship with God. And we're empowered by the Spirit to live in ways that enable others to experience this same recreation, this same kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is and continues to be established in us. It's also established through us. His kingdom overflows into our friendships, into our family lives, into our communities, into our responses to injustice, things like racism and the issues of the day, and so much more. Have a read of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to see some more of this ministry of recreation or reconciliation that we're called into. In the days ahead, I thought it would be good if we took time to reflect on various scripture references, the ones that I've referred to in this piece already, and in particular by reading through Colossians 1. You've heard some of it read earlier um, in this video clip. It's a powerful passage. It bursts out with the vision of God and of recreation and of his kingdom here amongst us. It's one of my absolute favourites, particularly if you read it in the message. As you read it through this week, and as you reflect on the other verses and passages of scripture that we've referred to this week, let's have a look at three questions and reflect on them together. What do you see about God's character? as you read in these passages. You might like to jot down the, the various things that you see about what, what the passages describe about God. What do you see in Genesis 1 of God's character when you see the creation story? What do you see in John 3 when you read about Nicodemus and Jesus? And what do you see of God's character and the character of Jesus in that? And in Colossians 1, what do you learn about God's character? And then the second question, what do these passages show you that God's kingdom on earth looks like? Have a read again of Genesis 1. What do you see God's kingdom being created like in the first instance? What does God's kingdom get described as, as you read in in John 3, and as you read in 2 Corinthians 5, and as you read especially in Colossians chapter 1? What does God's kingdom look like? What descriptions do you find there? Maybe make a note of those things and have a think about them as you're going about your daily tasks. And the third question, what does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? How is God stirring you and me to join in with this vision of the future? What can you and I do and be to enable God's kingdom to come, God's will to be done on earth? Are there some things that God is just particularly prompting you about in how you live and who you are and what you aspire toward in terms of your vision? in order that you can be part of establishing God's kingdom in other people's lives. What does it say to us as a wider church? Lots of questions, lots to think about. Take pen and paper sit down somewhere comfy and spend some time with the Lord. And may God bless you in the days ahead. 
quand même. As we pause to pray together this week, let's focus on people that we know in this area who are offering care to people who they live with. Loving God, one in three persons, giving and receiving in a dance of unending grace, by your life poured out in the sending of your Son, and by your Spirit poured out on all flesh, we know ourselves embraced in your unending care. As we remember this week the millions who care for relatives at home, unpaid and unseen. Restore those who are exhausted by the physical and emotional demands of care without respite, who must keep giving but who need also to receive. Root and ground us all in your love for us, that as we seek to care for one another we may know ourselves sustained and held in the love that will not let us go. Remind your world that so often knows the price but not the value of things, that such priceless sacrificial care is at the heart of the love that made all things and that sustains all things in being. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've been thinking about a vision of God's kingdom here on earth being established through God, the work of the Holy Spirit and through us. Here's a song of prayer that asks, build your kingdom here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Your church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor.
darkness clear Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Set your church on fire Win this nation back Change the atmosphere Build your kingdom here We pray And if you want to listen to the whole of Colossians 1 read from the message, here it is now. So I'm going to read to you one of my all-time favourite passages of scripture. It's Colossians 1 and I'm reading from the message. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. I, Paul, have been sent on special assignment by Christ as part of God's master plan. Together with my friend Timothy, I greet the Christians and stalwart followers of Christ who live in Colossae. May everything good from God our Father be yours. Our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgiving. We can't quit thanking God our Father and Jesus our Messiah for you. We keep getting reports of your steady faith in Christ, our Jesus, and the love you continually extend to all Christians. The lines of purpose in your life never grow slack, tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. The message is as true among you today as when you first heard it. It doesn't diminish or weaken over time, it's the same all over the world. The message bears fruit and gets larger and stronger just as it has in you. From the very first day you heard and recognised the truth of what God is doing, you've been hungry for more. It's as vigorous in you now as when you heard it from our friend and close associate Epaphras. He is one reliable worker for Christ. I could always depend on him. He's the one who told us how thoroughly love had been worked into your lives by the Spirit. Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to his will, and so acquire a thorough understanding of the ways in which God works. We pray that you'll live well for the Master, making him proud of you as you work hard in his orchard. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work, we pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It is strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. God rescued us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the Son he loves so much. The Son who got us out of the pit we were in, got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep on repeating. We look at this Son, Jesus, and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this Son and see God's original purpose in everything created, for everything Absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organises and holds it together like a head does a body. He, Jesus, was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, 
but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got, but now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you, brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy, in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned in to the message, careful not to be distracted, or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Every creature under heaven gets this same message, and I, Paul, am a messenger of this message. I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in the world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church as part of that suffering. When I became a servant in his church, I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. This mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time, and now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know how rich and glorious the secret inside and out is, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The mystery in a nutshell is just this, Christ is in you, so therefore you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ no more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard to at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. Amen.